teachers will have the same expectations and preferences for writing. The problem is complex and must be addressed on an individual basis. People often ask, um, you know, I have a class with a couple non-native speakers in it, but mostly native speakers of English. What do I do when I try to assess them? I mean, should I hold everybody to the same standard? Realistically, I don't think, I don't think that's a realistic thing to do. What I would suggest, instead of having everyone work at, uh, at the same level, to make some decision in your class about what will be good enough, not what will be perfect, not what will be without flaw, but what will be good enough for your class. And then, when you look at things that way, you, cannot, you can be less distracted by small things in people's papers that might cause you to uh, rate them lower. For example, People accept that someone might, someone from a foreign country will speak with a foreign accent. I think it's just as fair to, th it's, it's the same thing to suggest that people will write with an accent. And usually that accent consists of things like missing articles or um, prepositions, wrong prepositions and things like that. Things that really don't make much difference. Yeah, in grading international students and being fair, grammar always comes up. As, as a question. This is, you know, no doubt, because you notice it. One of the things that uh, we try to focus on is how comprehensible are the ideas? Is the grammar getting in the way? If somebody is uh, writing or speaking and you don't know when something's happening and it's important to know this, well, I mean, they need to get dinged for that because it's, you know, you've, you have a loss of comprehensibility. The message is not getting through. If it's a question of putting an S on a third person, like he goes rather than he go, so here, I mean, we're going to figure uh, out it's what it is uh, with or without the S. Now, the other classic one is the article system in English, which you know, um, I believe, like many others, is designed mostly to show who's a native speaker, not to serve any communicative function, really. So, you know, making a mistake in whether you forget to put an a uh or you put a the inappropriately is pretty, uh, well, more than minor. It's inconsequential, I'd say, 99% of the time. So to say that, oh, you're being equal is not necessarily being fair. To be fair to international students, you take into account the fact that this is a second language for them, and you hold them to the same standards of meaning and quality of thought and content. But you say, well, how, much of, how many of the errors that are being made really detract from meaning? Probably the most important thing to remember when assessing international students is to consider the many linguistic subtleties that native speakers take for granted. Most of these errors aren't easily explained by rules and must simply be memorized. These mistakes often appear in prepositions following verbs, such as, I turned my paper on to my teacher, instead of, I turned my paper in. Other times, students may use words in ways that native speakers find awkward or confusing, such as, the cowboy ascended his horse instead of mounted his horse. These lexical errors are easy to grade because they're easy to spot, but marking down for them is counterproductive because it discourages learning. It frustrates students who have written an otherwise thoughtful and intelligent piece by marking them down for errors they can't avoid. It also stunts their language growth. In order to become proficient writers, international students must be bold in experimenting. One thing I really struggle about writing in America is time. One time I had to take exam, essay exam in a class, which was about slides, and teacher gave us only seven minutes per slide. So we had to write as quick as possible. And it was really frustrating for me because I can't write that fast. Testing is a real issue for uh, international students. The things that most dramatically disadvantage them, both in teaching and testing, are anything that asks for immediate response. And 
immediate thoughtful response that international students are as good as anybody else at memorizing canned answers. I mean, that's, that's not the problem. They can come up with you know, quick answers that are rote, like anybody else can. But where you want something more thoughtful, either in a discussion or in uh, writing, it takes longer just because the processing time is longer. I don't see it as unfair to native speakers to say, well, you know, we're going to do it in a different way for international students, or to just structure the test differently, where you give people more time. So if it means not having as many items within the stated amount of time, giving more time, having more things that are perhaps take home when you want real reflection to go on, I think this is a better approach. And it helps not only international students, but, but anybody who is not just geared toward immediate production in text. In addition to rethinking testing strategies, it's important for teachers to begin rethinking their own cultural assumptions. It's easy to forget, for example, that not everyone is aware of the cultural significance of Woodstock or is comfortable writing about politics, sex, religion, or other topics that come up frequently in American classrooms. I think teachers should be careful about what they assign. Um, when I took introductory composition class, one of the assignment was uh, reading articles about Jay Leno and David Letterman and write paper about them. And at that time, I was in the United States only one year, so I even didn't know who were David Letterman or Jay Leno. Native speaker writing classrooms are often highly politicized. That is, the teacher wants it to be highly politicized. They want to talk about politics, institutions, so on and so forth. And a lot of people want to take that over into the second language, but don't realize that it's such a dangerous issue and you can make people feel so uncomfortable about it. Here's somebody coming from China and you want them to, you want them to critique something uh, about American institutions, right? Already the person's thinking, when I go to the United States, I'm going to do what they tell me, so I don't get in trouble, so on and so forth. And then you have a teacher saying, you know, you know, I'd like you to critique this American institution. First of all, a student might not know much about it. Secondly, the student uh, may not want to talk about it at all. So that's an issue that um, we don't, that's an issue that we don't talk about enough, I think, because uh, writing in the United States, um, teachers, teachers really want to politicize it, and for good reasons, I think. But it's really iffy to make that transition over to, over to another group. Adapting teaching and testing practices can be challenging, since the goal is to acknowledge fundamental differences in culture and language. But some of the best ways to help international students succeed are easy to implement. In my classes, one of the first things I do with international students is to ask them to meet with me individually. I might ask a student about their own experiences as a writer in their own culture, um, whether they consider themselves strong writers or, or not strong writers in their own experience. Um, then I also ask them how they're experiencing writing here in the university, and often they're very worried about themselves as writers in English. And so it's important to talk about what helps them most uh, to improve as writers. And often they know what helps them most. So I, I say, how do you want me to respond on your papers? Do you want me to mark lots of errors, or do you want me to just mark your papers the way I do uh, any other student in the class? Typically, the international students have a strong view about what helps them. They know, and it's not always the same answer. Teachers, they can comment a lot of things in papers and they're very helpful sometimes and sometimes they're not. Teachers um, write a lot of comments and especially they use pens like red pens or very bright colors. So if you're um, coming to them for your first year, this is your first paper, you know, I don't know if women may cry or not, but you're pretty discouraged after seeing a lot of bad comments. Sometimes they're so small you know, there's more red than what you actually wrote on the paper, so that's very sad. Um, so I would feel like if the teachers would not comment out, you know, not cross out so many different small mistakes, and if they would put a longer comments, like sentence-based comments, okay, you know, um, this sentence or this paragraph would be a little tighter or more concise if you would phrase it this way, or maybe if you take out this word and maybe replace it with another one. 
So that would be more helpful. Most of instructors and professors know um, international students are having a hard time. But the problem is, um, they're very kind also, but the problem is they are not acting as they are thinking. So they know that we are having problems, but they, they are not doing anything. So I hope um, their behavior, like their action, could, uh, will be the same as their thought and their expectations. Yeah. Adapting classrooms for international students doesn't mean lowering standards or making the material easier. It doesn't require becoming an expert on culture or becoming well-versed in ESL techniques. What it does require is empathy for those students who come from different cultures and languages and then trying to predict the difficulties they might have. It means making a conscious decision to think from other perspectives and then applying that knowledge to the classroom. One of the, the things that I think is, is very important for all of us to keep in mind is so often uh, faculty look at international students as a problem in their class. I think that this is you know, uh, an unfortunate viewpoint because in so many ways the richness that these other perspectives bring, we cannot get any other way when we as Americans are talking to other Americans, especially people who've all grown up in the same sort of environment and the same background or talking to other people with the same background. We simply cannot see parts of the world or parts of our reality in a different way. Um, I think of American writing as being in some ways like an Indian raga, where the first phrase in a raga sets out every note that will be played throughout the entire piece. In the same way, an introduction in you know, American writing, academic writing, sets out the themes that will be carried through the entire piece of writing. So it's not like we start at the beginning and we get directly to the end. We start at the beginning, we've set the scene, and as you go through the writing, you're bringing up different themes from the introduction until you get to the end, which was predicted in the beginning. So it's sort of like threads going through rather than, oh, direct arrow, you know, all the way to the end. As native speakers and native writers, we don't have any vision of how we do that.